Okay, um, welcome to week five of DIS 630. We're shifting gears just a little bit at this point. In the last couple of weeks we've been talking about ethics and, and the relationship to disability policy analysis. The readings for this week really help us then shift a little bit of focus but also bring to bear some of the uh, discussions about ethics as well. As we begin, begin moving to global viewpoints in the readings really looking at comparative international perspectives. Uh, I've posted a PowerPoint that will go along with this, but the general points for the readings for this week really are uh, for us to think about disability policy really is not universal, um, that one size fits all is not a reasonable approach. And So in some of the readings that you'll do for this week we look at, is it possible to apply a model around disability policy, whether it's embedded, or implicit or whatever it might be uh, from a developed country to a developing country and what are some of the issues there. Um, policy I think believe, needs to be crafted with the context in mind. We'll read about geographies of disability. So thinking about the context, the geography, political circumstances, economic circumstances. Uh, questions for you and for us this week are what are the factors that contribute to policies that are relevant for specific groups in specific locations? That's one of your questions for the week. These readings were designed to provoke our thinking about the diversity of experiences and lives around the globe and in the U.S. as well, and to link these analysis to policy formulation. Within this, you know, the first question in one of our readings um, discusses the issue of barrier and barrier free. And so the title of the PowerPoint is Barrier Free is Not Barrier Free. And so I would ask you to think about and respond to what are elements shape a, quote, barrier free environment. What do we mean by that in terms of issues around physical, social, economic, um, sensory, educational, political, or are there other factors? So when we're thinking about barrier free. And how do these elements differ? in their definitions depending upon the location. So if you think about a developing country, are the barriers that might exist there similar to or different from barriers that might exist in a country, say, as Canada or the United Kingdom? One of the thinking points, again, for us to respond to this week is how might the barriers to full participation be, develop be different in developing countries versus developed countries. So are there different barriers depending upon the country or the nature of the country? If there are differences, what policy analysis and formulation models other than universal policy would be appropriate? So if we're beginning just to identify different barriers or different issues depending upon developing developed country, however you may want to define that, and I would encourage you to search up a definition for those terms, think about how that the nature of the economics and social circumstances in those countries might influence policy development. From the work um, looking at Indonesia, um, the cultural differences and policy implications is that policies for individualistic societies um, might emphasize is issues such as personal goals, autonomy, self-reliance, and independence, um, and self-control being issues related to guilt. Um, Versus when we think about um, countries and or ultimately communities, I'm pushing you to think about where collective societies might emphasize in-group goals, duty, conformity, cooperation, sacrifice, where social control around um, access and issues and resources ends up being around uh, issues of shame. And so what in industrialized and in affluent societies might define independence differently than less affluent countries. If I, example there would be specialized transportation would not be relevant for those who can afford to hire a driver. Or in countries where having a driver um, is part of a standard for a professional class. Um, so suddenly needing to have something such as um, an adaptive uh, service begins to call the question in terms of is, is that something that should be legislated, should that be part of policy. Um, the suggestion, and this is the next thinking point, is, is that we need to appreciate the differences between disability in developing countries and disability in developed countries. In part his argument is that, an, that a 
nomothetic model of international disability is inadequate. When we think of nomothetic, it assumes a kind of great group homogeneity. And so if, if the suggestion is, is that a nomothetic policy is not workable for thinking about um, multiple countries, I, I would ask us also, should we assume that nomothetic models of disability should exist within national boundaries? Um, for developed countries or f and for developing countries. So again, is the point that he makes is that a nomothetic perspective applying what's happening, say, in Canada or the United States to Indonesia, doesn't ne is not necessarily applicable. I would ask us to use the same questioning when we think about nomothetic policy, say, within the United States. Are the issues for people living in rural parts of of the United States similar to or different from people living in, say, New York City? And might we want to have um, different policies or, or think um, more of a ideographic, which is not an individual basis? And what is that? how does that influence policy? McEwen and Butler, and they really take us into problems of cross-cultural analysis of disability, they really begin talking about a lack of shared definition of disability across culture and time, and in developing countries, disability policy might and should be embedded or implicit within policies that serve to create impairments such as malnutrition, poverty, landmines, lack of health um, services. So for, for thinking about disability, are there policies that we might want to think about if, we're, if we are in a developing country that serve to create um, impairments such as open fire, exposed kerosene heaters, unprotected stairways, uh, poor quality construction, lack of safe storage of chemicals and poison, piles of debris, uh, poor waste disposal, heavy traffic, scarcity of play playing areas. So when we begin thinking about those as potentially causative factors, um, the question I would have to you is if we address those issues as implicit disability policy, what does that do to change the nature of how we think of disability? Um, along that line, it might be possible in terms of international disability implicit policies, remember this is a category that we came up with uh, two or three weeks ago, is that we might begin to think about disability implicit policies as involving improvements of general living conditions and standards, eradication of specific diseases access to improved basic health care services, being able to get to a hospital or having good hospital care or health care, um, access to clean water supplies and sanitation, decreased risk of exposure to environmental hazards, increased quality of, of nutrition, decreased exposure to the effects of conflict, and increased access to safe uh, forms of transportation. Finally, Memor Freeman and Okama um, ask us to think, and though they sh are not talking in this case about disability policy, but talking about health policy in general, and I'm asking for you to read their work and think about if you were to substitute the word disability for health and what might come up, and how do the policies of health and health policy relate to disability policy? Nationally, over overall fiscal strain leads to predictable um, internal policy scrutiny. That's their suggestion that restricted capacity for fiscal expansion in new areas leading to managing existing programs or even cutting back. And kind of a changing post-war, what they mean by that is a changing World War II consensus about the welfare state seems to be occurring simultaneously in multiple countries. That the economic strain leads to weakening of social welfare programs, a basic commitment to welfare program protections, and incentives to transformation of current health and welfare uh, programs. So overall, what I want us to do this week is think about some of those comparisons. Think about, particularly in respect to this last article around health policy and the changing economics and decisions people make about what they're going to pay for and what they're going to learn for. How does that reflect an ethical model or what ethical models are reflected in that? Um, I look forward to hearing your discussion, reading your discussion online. I will also, um, a little bit later, I'll post another video where I talk about the final assignment, but I'll chat with you later. Thank you very much.